Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. OK, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice uh, Committee. And if you can do your needful with any electronic devices, it would be appreciated. Any financial or other relevant interests related to items of today's business, now is the time to declare it. If not, we... Um, yes, Rachel. If we can bring Rachel Woods in. Thank you, Chair. It's just with regard to item uh, 15.7 in correspondence. Okay, thank you. We'll record that. Apologies then from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan, and then we are joined on Starleaf by Linda Dillon, Doug Beatty, Paul Free, Rachel Woods, Nia Bradley, and Gemma Dolan. And if the clerk can just advise of any delegation of votes. Thank you. Understanding Order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairperson, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Then, agenda item two is the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 15th of April, and if members are content that they're a true reflection of those proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. If members are content. There's no discontents. Okay, thank you. Just some matters arising. First item is the UK Financial Services Bill, the LCM. Um, at the meeting on the 18th of March, the committee considered the correspondence from the Minister of Justice, advising she had received a request from the Economic Secretary to Treasury on the 8th of February to consider the legislative consent for clauses in the Financial Services Bill. The purpose of that clause was to ensure law enforcement was able to quickly and efficiently freeze and forfeit proceeds of crime and terrorist property not just held in bank and building to society accounts, but also in, in electronic money and payment institutions accounts. The Minister had indicated to the Economic Secretary of the Treasury that it would not be feasible for the LCM to proceed within the short time scale allowed, and the UK Government therefore tabled an amendment to the Bill so that the provision does not extend to Northern Ireland. The Minister subsequently laid a memorandum in the Assembly on the 26th of March in accordance with the relevant standing order, explaining why an LCM is not being sought, and this was noted by the Committee at uh, last week's meeting. At the meeting of the 18th of March, the committee agreed to request information from DOJ on the potential consequences for Northern Ireland of not being included in the provisions and clarification of whether cryptocurrency is covered by the provision and to request information from the Policing Board and implication for the powers of the PSNI and risks associated with the provision not extending to Northern Ireland. So a response, members, has been received uh, from the Department. Uh, the Policing Board has sought input from the Police Service and has indicated that it hopes to respond in the next couple of weeks. So if members can note the Department's response at this stage, and then we'll consider the matter further when the Placing Board response is available. So we'll duly note it. Item two is uh, correspondence from the Minister for Justice, uh, providing an update on a further meeting between her, the Finance Minister, First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and the Secretary of State, that took place on the 7th of April in respect of the uh, Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. Um, his offer to provide access of £100 million of new decade new approach funding for the financial years 22-23 to 25-26 was discussed, and the Northern Ireland ministers indicated strongly to him that the offer of financial support fell considerably short of what was expected, and the UK government needed to provide additional funding to avoid a financial strain on the Northern Ireland block grant. The Justice Minister also raised concerns about the impact of the funding or proposed legacy arrangements if the funding was being diverted from that set aside for the arrangements envisaged in NDNA. The Secretary of State indicated that there was no further funding being made available for the scheme. However, he did agree to a further meeting uh, later in the year when more detailed information would be available on the profile of applications to the scheme, which would inform a more accurate estimate of the costs. So the Justice Minister has indicated that financial discussions with the UK Government will be continuing uh, to be progressed in the context of its uh, funding responsibilities of the scheme. In the meantime, however, and in response to the recent legal challenge, there is an undertaking uh, provided to the court that payments will be made to successful applicants under the scheme, which will provide the reassurance and confidence to victims. So if members can note the current position in respect of the funding for the scheme, we'll seek agreement then if we can ask the Minister to keep the committee updated on the further meetings um, and any more developments, and obviously, members, we can return to this issue. I was going to propose that a copy of the Minister's letter would be sent to the representative victims groups that recently attended the informal meeting to keep them uh, updated as well, if members are content uh, that we do that. 
Okay, thank you. Um, correspondence from the committee uh, for the executive office on the, the same issue. The executive office has written providing uh, information that it received from the executive office on its budget, which includes figures relating to victims' payments, which may be of interest to this committee. It also provided a copy of the Government Actuaries Department report, which the committee has already received from the Committee for Finance, which members noted last uh, at last week's meeting. So that information from the executive office committee is there for noting. Agenda item four, then, members, if we can turn to the Criminal Justice Committal uh, reform bill, which is the main substance, substantive point of the, the meeting, uh, in terms of our informal consideration of the clauses of this bill. So, just a, a recap um, on, on where we are at the moment on this. It's pages 28 to 208 of your meeting pack is where the relevant papers are, and then there's the clerk's memo um, at pages 29 to 33. So officials from the department attended our meeting on the 25th of March to discuss the issues that were raised in the evidence received uh, on the bill and to also answer members' questions. During the evidence session, the officials agreed to provide further information on a number of issues, including the current costs of committal proceedings, the modelling to determine the legal aid changes needed and the anticipated costs, the average length of time taken to dispose of different types of Crown Court cases, and the mechanisms that will be used to evaluate the effectiveness of the legislation. The response from the Department providing the information and the Hansard of the oral evidence session are at pages 101 to 126 of the meeting pack. The Lord Chief Justice also wrote to the Committee indicating that reform of the committal process is vital and something that he has been pressing for since 2012. In his view, it's, it is difficult to sustain any argument for the retention of the current committal process, and he endorses the proposed changes. Um, so, members, we will now undertake the informal deliberations on the clauses of the bill. We do have departmental officials, um, or departmental officials that indicated on the 25th of March, sorry, that the department does not intend to propose any amendments to the bill as it was introduced. Um, Informal deliberations, of course, provide an opportunity for members to discuss the issues that have been raised, indicate whether they are content with the clauses, require any further information or clarity, um, clarification, uh, where you wish to amend a particular clause or are minded to reject particular clauses, uh, now is the time to do that. If members need more time to consider a particular clause or clauses, the committee can continue its deliberations um, next week. So members will... Uh, will know that when accepting a clause, members can express views and make comments, and the committee can also then make recommendations uh, where we're not making any amendments. Um, so, for example, with regard to the implementation of or outworking of a clause, and we can reflect that in the committee report on the bill. If the committee is minded to make amendments to any of the clauses, the purpose and the desired outcome of the amendment needs to be uh, clear. The committee may then wish to write to the Minister asking whether she accepts the proposed change and will table an amendment alternatively, or at the same time the committee can ask for a draft amendment to be prepared by the Bill Clerk for its consideration, and uh, the Bill Clerk, Stephanie Mallon, is also listening in to the committee's deliberations today. If the committee indicates that it wants any draft amendments prepared, then Stephanie will attend the meeting next week to provide advice and seek, and seek clarification of the purpose of the proposed amendment should that be necessary, members. So we do have officials uh, joining on Starleaf. Um, so Glenn Capper and Laura Mallon uh, are available uh, if members need uh, to get clarity on any aspects of the clauses that we will now move into considering. So while the discussions will focus on the issues raised in the evidence, the majority of responses welcomed and supported the provisions within the bill. So we just haven't set the context, members. If you're happy, let's go into um, clauses one and two, which are taken together. Uh, of course, these are the, the primary clauses that give the purpose behind the bill um, in terms of uh, abolishing the preliminary investigations. Is clause one and clause two abolishes mixed committals and evidence on oath not to be given at a preliminary inquiry. So the key issues that had been highlighted, members, um, in respect of these two clauses uh, included whether oral hearings at committal stage should be abolished completely, whether implementing the interests of justice provisions in the Justice Act 2015 would appropriately safeguard the rights of all parties instead of abol abolishing the committal process entirely, 
whether restricting oral evidence at a committal hearing to expert witnesses only would be more appropriate than um, <coughs> abolishing oral evidence uh, entirely. So, members, I'm happy to take your views on clauses one and two, if members are, are in a position to indicate around that. Um, I'll go ahead and just give my initial view on it too. So, um, based upon the evidence that I've received, I've taken that on board and i um, relatively content to proceed with clauses one and two as currently drafted in the bill. Um, so I'm happy to take feedback um, from members. I do think there's some validity in the points made around the provisions that had been in 2015, having not been put in place, um, but nevertheless, that's a point that I'm happy to, to see incorporated in a committee report um, around this, but uh, I've heard the evidence and my own view is that we can uh, proceed with clauses one and two, and that's my own position on that. If I can take feedback then from other members in terms of their views, happy to go round the houses if I need to. So, Linda Dillon. I'm going to assume because nobody's indicating sure everybody's happy with it. Um, uh, much like yourself, I, I accept some of the, the issues that have been raised and did actually inquire around what's currently happening around legislation on preliminary inquiries in the 26 counties um, to see is there anything that we should be looking at there that lessons might be learned. But it's a very, very different process and there would be no opportunity for um, oral evidence from any witnesses or victims. And I mean, I think for me, the importance of this piece of work is actually, because I, th I think everything we've heard outlines that we can't really get any assurances that it's going to significantly speed up justice and whilst that's extremely important and we do want to see a bigger um, piece of work around speeding up justice for me the important part of this is that reassurance particularly for victims that they won't be cross-examined um, twice that they won't have to give oral evidence twice and I think that that I mean, I've been very open about that from the start. For me, that was a really important element of this um, bill. And I mean, clause one and two ensure that that will no longer be the case. So I am content okay. for them to go as, as they are. Okay, thank you, Linda. Rachel Woods? Or maybe that hands from a, a previous time, sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry, it's not. Thank you. Um, no, I, I would also be content with clauses one and two. Um, obviously, it's difficult to know regarding the 2015 Act if the clauses weren't commenced, so there's not really much that we can compare on. And unlike Linda, I, I do have sympathy in terms of the speeding up justice piece and whether or not this actually will. But I think that there's wider pieces of work that needs to be done on this and obviously is going on. Um, but no, absolutely, I think uh, one and two are, are fine the way they are. Okay. Well, I, I, when I get through the, all of the clauses, I'll come back to some of the areas that we maybe want to make wider commentary on um, in, in respect of the things that we've identified through this process. But if everyone else is content then um, with clauses one and two, um, then we'll move to clause three. Um, clause three makes provision for the consequential amendments and repeals, most of which relate to the removing of references to preliminary investigations or mixed committals and other pieces of legislation. So there were no issues raised in the evidence in relation to uh, this clause. So members, um, Rachel, I see your hand up. Thanks, Chair. It was just with regard to the schedule. Um, it refers to the, um, sorry, but I completely lost it. It is refers to the Mental Health Northern Ireland Order 1986. Um, it's my understanding that that order is due to be um, subsumed by the Mental Capacity Act. I'm wondering if that needs to be looked at or changed. Well, we can check what the process would be for how you update. It may well be within the schedules. You have provisions to amend the schedules. Call ask Glenn. Might be able to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you do that? Um, Glenn, if, I, if we can bring the officials in from the audience, then, um, and we'll put that to to Glenn. Glenn, did you pick Thanks, up? Chair. You picked up on that yeah. point, okay? 
Yeah, just checking you can hear us okay, Chair? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, Laura and I were just discussing that point, Chair. What we think it's going to be a, a, a matter of the sequencing and timing, so one will update the other depending on sequencing. But yes, we, 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 we'll make sure that's taken account of. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Rachel, that should address that point. So if members are content then with Clause 3, um, we'll move on to, to Clause 4. So Clause 4 makes provision in respect of the dire direct committal for certain offences and for discontinuance of proceedings after the accused has been committed for trial. So if I can just give a recap of uh, some of the issues that were raised around the evidence um, and discussed then subsequently with officials. They covered, um, one, whether the removal of a committal stage infringes defendants' rights to a trial within a reasonable time under Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Two, is there a risk that speculative or weak prosecutions would uh, proceed directly to Crown Court rather than being weeded out at the committal stage? Three, whether the removal of the potential of direct committal for those charged with a non-specified offence who indicate an intention to plead guilty by the repeal of Section 10 of the 2015 Act is detrimental to those defendants. Four, whether the safeguards included in the Bill to ensure that pre-sentence reports are only ordered by the Magistrates' Court when all parties agree there is a benefit in doing so are appropriate and sufficient. Fifthly, in the, if the application to dismiss provides a fair procedure in direct committal cases for defendants to challenge a case where it appears the evidence would not be sufficient to convict them. Finally, and whether oral evidence should be retained for applications to dismiss applying the interests of um, justice test in the 2015 Act. So, members, that was just some of the, the, the key issues that have been highlighted in respect of this clause. Um, again, I'm content with clause for... Um, as has been included in the bill. So I'm happy to bring in any other comments. Rachel, your hand is up. No, it's from last time. That's OK. Um, so unless members have no other comments to make on clause four. Yes, sorry, Sinead. We just can't hear you at the moment, Sinead. Apologies, can yep. you hear me now? We can, yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, no, Chair, it's just I have some sympathies um, to some of the, the concerns raised on that clause, and I have yet anything in the form of a solution to them. Um, but the objective of the, the principle of the clause, you know, I'm supportive of and content to proceed with, but I'd just like to, to put on record um, my concerns on some of the issues raised. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, and again, we'll, we can incorporate some commentary around that in terms of the, the report on the bill um, as well. Okay, then, members, if we're content with Clause 4, then Clause 5 um, makes provision in relation to the commencement of the provisions by order and that provisions relating to the abolition of oral evidence from the committal process and direct committal will not apply to proceedings instituted before the Department has commenced the relevant provisions of the bill. So there were no issues raised in the evidence um, in relation to uh, this clause. So if members, uh, yeah, Linda Dillon. Sure, no issues other than th there's no actual commencement date or timeline. I'm just wondering, is that something that will be included or is it something that we would want to see as a committee being included? Um, I'm reading the commencement of that upon royal assent. Is that right? So this section and section six come into operation on the day after on which the act receives royal assent. Glenn, do you want to just clarify? Am I am I am I right in that? What? Um, section five, um, the uh, provisions of the bill um, in terms of five and six come in um, directly on royal assent. Um, the, if you look at 5.2 there, that allows for the department to specify a date, um, and that will um, from that will be the date from which the the, the remainder of the um, provisions will come into force. Mm -hmm. um, the the reason we don't have a timeline as yet is because we need the bill in. I know the timeline of it to set it up, but we have always said oral evidence will be within. Um, a short time after Royal Assent Committal Reform, um, the substantive part of, of Clause 4 will be um, have a slightly longer lead-in time 
Um, but in the coming months, once we know sort of more refinement um, in terms of the bill, we'll be able to give a more detailed um, indication of when that can be commenced. Yes, okay. So I suppose, okay. Linda, that takes you back to your question. If, if we're wanting to put a date on that, um, no, and, I, and I'm not necessarily chair, I was just asking, I assumed, but I never like to assume anything, but I did assume it was because obviously putting a date in without knowing how long the committee stage would take would be very difficult to, to do. Yeah. But I, I just wanted to clarify that that was the case and, and that's fair enough. No, I'm not necessarily saying that we need to put a date in there. I don't, um, I wouldn't have any concerns that it won't be done at the earliest possible opportunity. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well then, if members are content then with Clause 5, Clause 6 um, provides the short title of the bill and there were no issues raised um, in terms of the evidence in respect of this clause. So if members are content with Clause 6. Okay, so members, that, that concludes the informal deliberations on the actual clauses. Um, and. Aside from some of the commentary, maybe just to include, which I'll come to now, um, in terms of a broader piece, um, in terms of the actual clauses, um, the committee and no member of it has suggested any amendments to it in that respect, um, and that'll allow us to move on next week, or, or maybe not next week, but it'll allow us to um, move forward beyond having another informal consideration of the, the clauses. Some of the issues, I suppose, members then, that we did look at and they were touched on just earlier um, around the wider issues around the, the bill. Will it actually make the difference? Could the changes in 2015 have made a difference if they had it applied? And we might want to put some commentary around that. But areas, just to recap, that we did touch on, um, whether the bill will meet one of its key aims of removing some of the delay in the criminal uh, justice system, um, reforms to committal elsewhere appear to have shifted those delays to another part of the system. Much of the delay in the criminal justice system is at the investigatory stage. There is a need for more effective disclosure processes, such as the sharing of digital evidence. Whether statutory time limits or custody time limits could contribute to the reduction of delay in the criminal justice system. We commented um, on the robust case management by Crown Court judges and being required and is practice directions and court rules sufficient or should consideration be given to providing for case management in law. Legislation has been introduced then in the Republic of Ireland to introduce preliminary hearings which aim to reduce delays that in, uh, increase efficiency and fairness in the criminal trial process. So they were just some of the areas that we touched on throughout um, our consideration uh, of this. So a couple of points I think it would be worth having some commentary on and then I'm, I'll, I'll take views from other members. but. We could express concern regarding the time it takes for cases to progress through the criminal justice system, that we do need to have robust measures implemented to tackle avoidable delay and ensure substantial progress in this area. Um, within, uh, and we can specify a kind of time frame we would like to see that. Um, we could also, I think, uh, highlight the absolute need that the de delays are not just transferred from magistrate's court to the Crown Court once committal process is removed and that we would expect to see robust and effective case management procedures introduced and uh, implemented. So they're kind of two broad areas that I think it would be worth having some commentary prepared for the committee just to consider as part of our committee report. Is there any other areas that members you know, would like to see some commentary on in respect of, of this? And you know, that would allow the, the committee staff to start working up um, some drafts for us to consider. Um, I'll bring in Linda and then Rachel. Thank you, Chair. And I'm going to apologise to Rachel in case I'm going to raise what 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 she may be about to raise. Um, obviously, and and everything else we've done. One of the things that we've we've tried to ensure whatever piece of legislation or whatever policy or issue we're looking at that there is some accountability around it. So I, I would like to see us being updated on not even necessarily saying that something has to be in the legislation around this, but I do think it certainly needs to be in the report and the department need to be aware of it. I would like to see that, that the committee is regularly updated around the issues that you've just raised. So around the you know the impact that this actually has in terms of speeding up justice, if any, um, the impact that it has for 
those who had concerns about having to give evidence twice, if, if there's a way of doing that, and then some updating around, um, you know, how it feeds in then to the to the bigger overall picture of the the speeding up justice program, and if there are problems, you know, if there are blockages and if the blockage just moves really from one part of the court system to another, then we, we'd like to be made aware of that. I think that that's vitally important because when we bring through legislation, it's always with good intent. Anything we do, we want to do it for for a positive outcome. But if we don't, if we're not updated, if we're not kept informed about what happens after the legislation comes into being, then how do we know if it had any positive outcome? How do we know if we actually did anything that benefited the system or those who go through it? And, and, and you've outlined that yourself, Chair, in terms of the um, the comments that you've made yourself just, just prior to speaking. But I would imagine Rachel may well want to go further than, than me on the, the reporting issue, but I, I'm, I have no doubt it's an issue that, that she will also want to raise. It's something that she's been very focused on in terms of all pieces of legislation. But I do think it's important I, I would be in full agreement with her on that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Linda. Um, Rachel? Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yes, I think there's a big role here um, in terms of reporting back to committee, not this, just this committee, but future committees, and also um, what our role is in terms of post-legislative scrutiny. And Chair, you'll be aware I submitted a lengthy response to your call on post-legislative scrutiny as in terms of uh, legislative scrutiny of, as, of committees in your recent call for evidence. Um, I certainly think there does need to be, I don't know if it needs to be in legislation or if it's part of guidance that would accompany this or in the EFM or, or something that there would be regular reviews of the impact of this. Um, I, as I said, I do have some sympathy for this, not, at, not going to address the delays as it were um, it, as a whole in, in the criminal justice system. Obviously there's a larger piece of work that needs to go on and it, I appreciate it is going on with a number of the criminal justice agencies. But certainly, uh, if there was some way of um, reviewing or reporting back, um, if it needs to go in, I'm more than happy to look at that. But um, I'm also content with it not being if it is going to be something that we can, or at least the Assembly can, look at uh, post-legislatively. Um, I would also like to see some you know, mention about resourcing. Um, I'm aware that it's not popular to put resourcing in primary legislation. But we did hear loud and clear for organisations um, of like the Bar Library who were, were pointing towards resource sort of deficit, deficits or not being directed where they needed to be and ensuring that greater resources are directed towards um, the investigation and disclosure processes. So I think there, there, I would certainly welcome some commentary on that. Um, and also, as Linda says, in terms of the victim's testimony and experience, and about the levels of trauma and whether or not this is actually done, as it says in the tin, in terms of reducing that, having to give evidence twice, how their experiences are documented throughout the system as a bigger piece. Um, so I suppose there's quite a, quite a bit there, Chair, but um, absolutely the only other thing I would like some further clarity on and maybe in the report, I appreciate that the department has produced some figures, but it's all on the legal aid modelling and, and the, the, the changes that are going to be uh, necessitated by this legislation. I'm not asking for it in detail. I appreciate that this framework needs to be in first before we know where we're, um, where our resources and sort of funding needs to go with that one. But in terms of the impact on legal aid, um, I think this is something that we, we should um, consider putting into the report. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good. Uh, Chair, yes, it was, it's about the resourcing. I'll not, I'll not rehearse what's already been said, but fundamentally, I still am struggling to find the pace. One of the objectives originally presented was the, um, the speeding up of justice, and I, I still don't see that that objective is going to be um, achieved in any, great, in any great way. Now, there may be that there's... A, a more efficient, more efficiencies, and it could be somewhat faster, but I don't think it's the answer to that objective exclusively. And on that basis, I do see that it is about a shift in resources. It is about, you know, if the committal process is gone, there's no doubt that that, 
body of work will either shuffle downwards uh, to PPS or upwards to the Crown Court. And I just want to know then if we are fundamentally talking about a shift in operational works, then we need to understand a shift in resources as well as additional resources. So any detail we could get um, to run in tandem with this, because it may not be anything that warrants being on the face of the bill, but I do think it needs to be understood if we're to achieve any of the objectives that were presented at the outset. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, well, I think that has given us a very good steer of the kind of areas that we would like to see um, put forward in terms of you know, the report and recommendations that we could make. So that, that will allow a piece of work to be done, which we can then consider um, members. And, and there's nothing that no member has said there that I don't, that I don't disagree with. So um, we can hopefully get uh, committee positions uh, agreed around some recommendations in respect of that. Um, I'm not hearing that we're wanting to put forward any formal amendment, though, on any of those areas. Um, but we, we do want to put in to the report and make recommendations around that. So um, we proceed on, the, on that um, on that basis. So the formal clause by clause consideration, then members will be on the sixth of May. Um, so that's that's whenever we'll go through the the kind of formal process, um, and then we'll consider the committee report. Uh, after that at that stage. So thank you, members. That concludes the informal um, consideration. And can I thank um, Glenn and Laura, um, who have been more than helpful throughout this process. And I'll, I'll mention that in, in future meetings as well. But the response to the evidence from the department um, and the information that members have sought has been provided timely, professionally. And that has helped members to be able to come to a view on this um, very quickly. So Glenn and, and Laura, thank you for your, your work on behalf of the department with the committee. Okay, members. Um, we'll go on to agenda item five of today's meeting. Um, the protection from the, the stalking bill. It's just an update on uh, written evidence. So the call for written evidence on uh, this bill closed on Friday the 16th of April. Um, 40 submissions have been received. The uh, Public Prosecution Service and Rainbow Project both asked for a short extension to allow a submission to be made uh, before the end of this week. So um, that was allowed and, and uh, hopefully we'll get those responses in. There's a list of the responses has been provided in the table pack. Copies of the submissions have been placed in the electronic bill pack. An email with the link to this pack um, issued to members um, this morning. If members um, are agreeable, then uh, the written submissions will be placed on the committee web page, and then um, for next week's meeting, there'll be proposals around the oral evidence sessions um, that we need to have um, in, in respect of that. So the committee staff will look at the written submissions and see which ones uh, we should look at for oral hearings. If there's any jumping out at members, um, just drop a note to the clerk of the committee so that then that can help inform our consideration around who we should call for oral evidence at next week's meeting. But um, we'll have a we'll have a kind of preliminary list recommended to the committee based on the the where we think the most value can be had from the written submissions. Um, but members do do contact the clerk if you have any particular ones jumping out at you that you would like to to have included on that list um, for us all to consider next week. Uh, item, oh sorry, Sinead, I see your hand there. Oh no, sorry, that's from before. That's okay. Um, agenda item six. At our meeting on the 18th of March, the committee considered information provided by the department on the timescale for the introduction of the miscellaneous provisions bill and the areas to be covered in the bill and agreed to request details of the areas in which the department intends to bring forward provisions by way of amendments during the passage of the bill through the assembly. The Department has now advised that the provision relating to the legislative fix to address the error in the Sexual Offences Order 2008 have been removed from the Bill um, at introduction due to a related live judicial challenge uh, which is ongoing and they will be developed for inclusion by way of amendments at the consideration stage. The Department has also indicated <coughs> that it, it now intends to use the regulation making powers 
that were provided by the Committee in the Domestic Abuse Act to legislate by way of subordinate legislation for the domestic abuse protection notices and orders, rather than bringing forward amendments at consideration stage of the miscellaneous uh, provisions bill. Um, so, members, I'm glad the committee put those provisions in that bill now that they're being utilised. Um, the department has also provided details of the four policy areas the minister has already committed to bring forward by way of amendments to the bill, and has also indicated that the minister is considering opportunities to develop legislative solutions in consultation with her executive colleagues, and is looking at a number of possible other amendments covering the following removing the defence of reasonable chastisement, changing the minimum age of criminal responsibility, introducing exclusion zones for premises providing terminations, um, and repealing the common law offences of blasphemy and uh, blasphemy libel. So, members, it's there as information um, that has now been provided. This is the first that the committee has been advised of these four new policy areas that the minister is considering to bring in amendments subject to um, discussions and consultations with other executive colleagues. Um, I'll leave it up to members of their own views of, of having such a wide range of amendments being brought in by a department. Usually it's members of the Assembly would do this, but you've got significant policy areas here that the Minister is now considering bringing forward um, at an amendment uh, stage. Uh, I do think we should request information on any public consultations that have been or are being undertaken by the Department on these four areas that are currently under consideration by the Minister. Um, uh, so that the committee then can have that um, information available to us if indeed there is such information. So it's by way of an update, members, just to, to note at the moment there's no action for us to in that respect, but I'm happy for members to, to raise issues. Um, Linda Dillon. Sure, you've actually covered my point. I would like some information in relation to has there been any um, consultations or, or scope and work around those issues. I have to be upfront. They're all issues of concern to me. I have no issue at all with them being brought forward as potential amendments if it's possible to, to deal with them because they, they are all issues that I would like to see dealt with. But it would be it would be good to know just what, what is there for us to work from. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. Yes, absolutely. I would certainly welcome some clarity um, on what what is referenced here in terms of um, all four of them. Again, like Linda, I have um, particular viewpoints on them um, and certainly would um, welcome them being in legislation, but just by what, by what way. Um, I'm also mindful that uh, with regard to the exclusion zones, that there is a private members bill currently within the bills office, um, as far as I'm aware on this. So I'm wondering if there is any procedural issues with regard to having um, the department working on a policy which is already being drafted. Um, I'm not too sure if that um, if it sort of if that overlaps, um, and also what the process will be for the executive to approve these policies if they are coming from the department. Yeah, OK. Well, we can ask that, because um, I'd be interested to know, is the Minister able to introduce these amendments without executive approval, and will she need executive approval to do it? I, I anticipate a divergence of views on these four policy areas um, being expressed by members, and that's fine. I, I'm, it's perfectly reasonable to do that, but um, I, I think we're all agreed we'd like to find out the process that's been followed by the Department in respect of this by way of any consultation, information, assessment, analysis, and then any procedures whereby the Executive will have a role in considering ministerial amendments. Um, so we, we can raise that and, and ask the questions, members, uh, otherwise we, we will duly note it. Okay. Um, item 7, Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. The, the next four items on the agenda relate to proposals for statutory rules to bring three updated codes of practice and one new code of practice relating to the Proceeds of Crime Act into operation. Um, the codes reflect changes um, 
to the POCA that was introduced by the Criminal Finances Act of 2017. Um, which must be in operation prior to the commencement of the relevant CFA provisions. Um, it is envisaged that the codes of practice and all the outstanding CFA provisions for Northern Ireland come into operation on the same date to ensure the consistency of approach as the um, Proceeds of Crime Act is a UK-wide act. The codes follow the equivalent codes of practice covering the use of POCA powers and functions by reserve bodies in Northern Ireland. The Department undertook a public consultation on the four codes of practice and the Committee noted the outcome of the consultation and the final version of the codes at the meeting on the 11th of March. All the statutory rules are subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure. The revised code of practice under section 195T of the POCA provides guidance on the use of search and seizure powers in Northern Ireland and on the detention of property which has been seized by an appropriate uh, officer. So, members, if you're content with the proposal for the statutory rule to bring this code of practice into operation, or whether any uh, further information or clarification is needed. Okay, members, content. Um, the next um, statutory rule is the revised code of practice under section 293A of the uh, Proceeds of Crime Act permits constables and accredited financial investigators uh, in Northern Ireland to search persons, premises and vehicles for cash which is derived from or intended for use in unlawful conduct. The cash must not amount to less than the minimum amount which is currently £1,000. There is no maximum amount of cash that can be seized. The code provides guidance on the relevant approval, recording and reporting requirements relating to searches. So if members are content with that statutory rule. Okay, content. Um, the next one then uh, is item 9. Uh, the functions in chapter 2 of part 8 of the Proceeds of Crime Act relate to the conduct by appropriate officers of certain types of investigations which are authorised uh, by the Act concerned with the recovery of the proceeds of criminal conduct. The Code applies to a number of investigations conducted under um, the POCA, including confiscation investigations, detained cash investigations and money laundering investigations. As a result of amendments to the POCA made in the 2017 Criminal Finances Act, detained property investigations and frozen funds investigations are now also covered. The powers of investigation dealt with by this code relate to production orders, search and seizure warrants, customer information orders, account monitoring orders and disclosure orders. The code also covers requirements for interviews under disclosure orders so members are content with the, the statutory rule. We're content, okay. Then item number 10, um, the new code of practice under section 303I of the Proceeds of Crime Act will provide guidance on the exercise of powers to search for listed assets and to the application by officers for prior approval in order to uh, exercise the search powers. A list a listed asset is seizable where there are reasonable grounds to suspect that all or part of its recovery, recoverable property or is intended for use by any person in unlawful conduct and the value of the asset or the part of it that falls within scope is not less than the minimum value currently set at £1,000. So if members are content with that statutory rule, um, okay. Thank you. Item 11 then is uh, the final um, justice budget allocations. There's a written paper, so the Department has provided a briefing setting out its high level 21-22 um, financial budget allocations in advance of the oral briefing that's scheduled for the 29th of April um, with departmental officials. So the paper also includes an update on reduced requirements uh, declared to the Department of Finance after the January monitoring round, an explanation for the forecast outturn variance for January 2021 and the current position regarding the 2021 annual report and accounts. Um, so there will be an opportunity to discuss the allocations and pre key priorities when officials attend the meeting on the 29th of April, following which the committee can consider a response that we would then issue to the committee for finance. The clerk of that committee for finance has indicated that the budget process will be later than had been um, initially indicated and therefore responses to the committee for finance can now be submitted on the 20, by the 28th of May rather than the 6th of May. So members, there is a, a 
memo from the clerk in the table pack. Um, if members are agreeable, we will use that as the basis just to get more information from the department in advance of the oral evidence session. So if you're agreeable, we'll um, submit uh, requests for information covering all of those areas contained within the clerk's memo, um, unless there's any other areas. Yes, Sinead. Chair, just uh, while we're in the business of getting more information, and I could be wrong, and I stand to be corrected, um, I would be curious to know the EU exit requirements in previous submissions from the department, um, there were, you know, uh, to be fair, I think it was um, like submissions looking at PSNI only or different pieces, but there's, I've never been able to find a consistent thread on the potential cost of EU exit and the requirements. And now I see um, in a memo to the finance minister, it's at 5.7 million. Could we just get a good understanding of what that is and where it would be spent? Because I see the minister saying if this funding isn't secured, there could be further significant impacts. So I just, I don't feel that I've had a constant thread on the cost to the department and what bodies are requiring this money. Okay. Yeah, we, thank can, you. we can add that. Um, Gemma Dolan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. There's just two things that I'd like clarification on. Um, we were told that inescapable pressures were 55.7 million, but now it's being reduced to 30.2. I'd just like to know how were the pressures reduced? How do we get to 30.2? And what exactly was done to reduce them um, in the bodies mentioned um, on page 415? And the other one, um, the bid to the Department of Finance, 11.8 million transformation bid, what was included in that? And if we could get more information on that as well, it'd be great. Okay, thanks Gemma. And Rachel Woods? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy with all of the questions um, we put in just to get clarification, especially on frontline services and um, probation board and the restorative justice organisations would be great. Um, the 8 million for tackling paramilitary activity, which was held centrally, then put over to justice and then been taken back to finance, it's my understanding, or to the executive office. But is that ring fenced? Um, that would be my question. And also with regard to the um, finances from the Gillen review, um, it's been met by um, baseline costs. Um, and the lack of transformation funding then, what impact is that going to have on the commitments in New Decade, New Approach, specifically with regard to the addressing the findings recently in recently published reports from Sujini um, and Gillen and implementing Gillen, if there will be um, any foreseen impacts on that. Okay, yeah, we can do that. We can add that. Linda Dillon. Sure, Rachel has actually just covered it in, in relation to that recent Jenny report, so that, that's, I'm content that that's covered. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll get to that Jenny report and have it down for correspondence um, because there's maybe some wider commentary members want to, to make in respect of that. But yes, we'll add all of those um, into the financial asks of the department. Okay, then item 12. Um, at our meeting on the 18th of March, the committee considered correspondence from the Minister providing the report of the review of the lessons arising from the legislative error within Sexual Offences Order 2008 that led to the Public Prosecution Service setting aside a number of convictions for certain sexual offences that had been prosecuted between 2009 and 2017. The committee agreed to ask the Department for a response on the recommendations in the report and details of how they would be implemented. The Department has advised that the Minister agreed a total of 10 principal recommendations, seven of which are mainly for the Department of Justice and the wider uh, NICS policy community, and three which are for consideration by other key stakeholders, including the PPS, Executive Office and Office of Legislative Council. The Department has provided a briefing paper that sets out the implementation steps it has taken and any next steps indicated to date with regard to implementation of the other recommendations outside its control. Some replies remain outstanding from relevant organisations and the Department has indicated that it can provide a fuller response in due course when these have been received if uh, required. So if members are content um, to note this information, 
um, regarding the implementation of the recommendations uh, into the review uh, that has been carried out, and we will request a fuller response in due course um, in terms of um, further implementation. Members content with that? Okay. Item 13. At our meeting back in September of uh, last year, the committee considered information provided by the Department of Justice and Department of Health on a proposed consultation for a regional care and justice campus for children and young people at the Woodlands and Lakewood sites and the draft consultation document. The committee agreed to note the intention of the department, uh, subject to the agreement of the executive to undertake a 12-week uh, consultation on the proposals and to consider the matter further when um, the results of that were available. So the committee uh, also agreed to schedule an oral evidence um, session with the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People on the proposals and other justice-related children's issues in due course. And following a request from a number of organisations that work with and on behalf of young people who experience the care and justice system to hold an informal meeting with them to discuss concerns regarding the proposals. So the committee subsequently agreed to hold both following consideration of the briefing paper provided by the Department on the results of the consultation. The Minister has now provided a copy of that uh, consultation analysis report, which she and the Minister of Health intend to publish shortly. She's asked that the report isn't circulated more widely at this stage. The report summarises the responses to the consultation and sets out the DOJ and uh, Department of Health joint response and plans for next steps, which indicate that work to establish an integrated care and justice campus is being taken forward through a phased approach and work is underway to develop detailed policy proposals and implementation plans. Departmental officials are happy to provide any further information or briefing um, should the committee find that um, helpful. So just a couple of action points, members, if you're content um, to note the consultation analysis, unless there's anything more in respect of that consultation. Um, analysis that you want further clarity on uh, and again uh, then members just in respect of arrangements for uh, the informal meeting um, there is this consultation analysis report uh, is due to be published by the ministers um, and the organisations then would have had an opportunity to consider it so we don't just have a timeline yet as to when they plan to publish it um, but it would make sense to me that that informal meeting would take place once that's in the public domain. Otherwise, we're going to have an informal meeting without actually having that document more widely available beyond ourselves. So if you're agreeable, the plans will be made for that informal meeting um, to take place once this um, document is, is published. Um, and then, if members are content, we will, in advance of having the Children's Commissioner come into the committee, We'll just get written views um, from the Children's Commissioner uh, in advance of that, and then once it's published, um, we will schedule that oral evidence session, uh, not just on this issue, but then on the wider justice-related issues um, that members want to pick up with the Children's Commissioner. So that's just three action points to take forward. Um, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. Um, I read this in detail and the consultation analysis, and I have many, many questions to ask. I would um, query, first of all, um, if the Department of, or the Committee for Health have had the same briefing, and also just if we um, potentially could work together on something like this. But with regard to the consultation, Consultation is done, it seems, on a cost-neutral basis, and I would certainly query how that is going to happen, given there's no budget or business case or anything else allocated in terms of resourcing within this consultation. Um, the fact that the department is proposing to do this in a step-by-step -step process, um, I would, given it the, all of the policy positions and policy actions all in interlink, um, so I would certainly, I have many questions for the departments on this, and I do wonder if it would be worthwhile getting the officials for an oral briefing, um, and just to, to kind of talk through these steps, um, specifically as well with relation to legislation that might be required in a mandate if they're going to be going ahead with certain things like a head of operations or anything like that, um, how that's going to be done in a step process without um, the mandate. 
um, and especially then on the co on a cost neutral basis, um, and the issues that have very clearly come up with Section seventy five and human rights issues. So I, lots there, Chair. So um, just if if we could if could um, committee would be willing to schedule an oral oral evidence session with the Department of Health and Department of Justice on that. And I just want yeah, maybe try. I'm not sure when they're going to publish this. I'm just trying to think of the timing of that with the informal meeting with the groups. Should that be before that would happen or after? There may be issues from those in for that informal meeting that might be helpful to take into then with officials from the department. Um, I'm just thinking out loud here, so let, let me bring in Linda while I think about that. Linda? Um, I'm probably thinking much like yourself, Chair, that it would be valuable to, to have the conversation with the groups and organisations prior to doing that meeting. I think Rachel's suggestion about doing a joint meeting um, with the Health Committee, with ha both health and justice officials, attending is a valuable one. And then we, we kind of all know what's going on. And uh, just because it is cross cutting, it, I think there would certainly be value in that. I think that's also something that we should consider if it's if it's possible to do that I, I would certainly be interested in doing something like that okay thank you Chair. that's it well we can listen and answer is it possible yes it is you know there's no issue about committees holding a, a joint committee meeting um and if that's something that we wanted to do on this issue it'd just be a matter of scheduling so if you're agreeable we will do the informal meeting with these groups um, that will help feed into any other issues that we want to, to then pick up um, with the department on. Um, it may well be that we have that informal meeting and, and do that jointly with the Committee for Health as well. Um, that, that seems that would seem to make sense. So, okay, well then if you're agreed, we, we will let the committee clerk talk to the clerk of the Health Committee and see if we can organise um, this informal meeting on a joint basis whenever this report gets published and then if the health committee is agreeable um, to having a, 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 set, a joint session on this issue it would be a single issue meeting in that respect um, it would just be a matter of working out when we can do that and then we will um, get the children's commissioner um, before the justice committee um, in due course on these issues too okay Brand. Item 14, Civil Legal Aid Reform. The Legal Services Agency only provides legal aid funding for court-ordered mediation in children order cases. However, a um, recent judicial review has ruled that provision for funding should be made for intra-litigation mediation and other civil cases and arrangements for this should be made in, a consul in consultation with the legal profession. So the department has been working with the Law Society, Bar Council and other providers of mediation services to develop proposals and is now going to undertake a two-month consultation following which it will provide a post-consultation report and final proposals for the committee's uh, consideration. So, members, it's there to note in terms of the proposed consultation, and then we'll consider the matter further when the results of it are available. Members, content with that? Okay. Correspondence. There's ten items of correspondence uh, in the meeting pack, and then there's one item in the tabled pack. Let me draw attention just to two of the items in the meeting pack and correspondence in the tabled pack, and then I'll uh, let other members uh, come in. Um, Item two of the meeting pack is just a response from the department regarding the decision by the police, firearms and explosive branch to introduce an application process and fee for additional firearms magazines and whether that, uh, whether that is compatible with the current legislative position and fee structures. The department has indicated that the um, firearms explosive branch has paused the introduction of the change and agreed to draft and circulate a proposed interim solution which largely addresses the concerns around the charge of an additional fee and application process that was raised by the shooting organisations and at the same time maintains a control for authorising the possession of firearm magazines. And the uh, firearm explosive branch has also offered to arrange further meetings with the five main shooting organisations, elected reps and departmental officials to discuss any concerns or issues that there may be with an updated uh, proposal. So members, it's there for noting. And if you're agreed, we'll forward this response to 
the British Association of Shooting and Conservation and the Northern Iron Firearms Dealers Association, who had brought it to the committee's attention. Um, item three is then a response from the department to the committee's request for the time scale required by the working group to complete its work, considering the implications for the justice system in Northern Ireland of commencing section 49.1 of the Coroner and Justice Act of 2009. The Minister expects the working group to provide its final findings and recommendations to her by early June, and the committee will then receive an update when the Minister has had an opportunity to consider its report. So, again, members, if you're agreeable, um, if we can forward that response then to Sir Geoffrey Donaldson for his information as he is engaged with the committee on this. Uh, then item 12, um, the final item just I'm going to mention on cor correspondence is in the table pack, and that's the Sajini report of a follow-up review on the implementation of the recommendations and its thematic inspection of the handling of domestic violence and abuse cases by the criminal justice system. The Chief Inspector has expressed disappointment at the pace of progress to implement the recommendations in the Sajini report published in 2019. Uh, which aim to improve how the criminal justice system handles cases of domestic violence and abuse. The follow-up review has found that one re recommendation has been achieved, four have been partially achieved, and two um, have not been achieved. So, obviously, members, I know we'll all be disappointed um, by the findings uh, of this uh, report. It goes back to, I think, a point members made earlier that you can have all the legislation in the world around a whole range of issues, but if you actually don't follow it through and deliver on them, then um, it's not going to be effective. Uh, and that's certainly what is happening here, where we're not seeing the kind of progress that should be made to actually deliver on a whole range of different recommendations that were contained within this report. So I was going to recommend that the committee would write to the department that we would endorse the inspector's disappointment and request a timeline setting out when the work to implement each of those recommendations is going to be uh, completed. Um, I think we should do that, Member. So uh, I know, Rachel, you had previously indicated um, that you wanted to come in on this particular issue, so I'm happy to bring you in at this stage. Thanks, Chair. No, it's um, just to propose uh, the same as you have um, and get a response from the Department and sort of planned actions on this. Obviously, it is disappointing. The report speaks for itself, but we've had this report since 2019. So whilst I appreciate COVID and the pandemic and restrictions have obviously not assisted with certain um, progressing certain recommendations, you know, we, we know what we need to do. And especially given the passage of the domestic abuse bill now, um, there's a little bit more work that clearly needs to be done and making sure the recommendations are followed through. Um, after they're made um, and then what resourcing as well is going to be um, allocated to this and as I raised before on the budget, um, New Decade New Approach had a commitment to looking at the Gini, uh, reports and recommendations yet we have seen the transformation funding and Gillen funding not be allocated so it's just one to, for certainly I'll be, I'll be looking at um, but you know we, we have, we're still in, in semi-lockdown at the moment and um, domestic abuse and not being safe at home is certainly um, sharpened. Every, it's sharpened in everybody's minds. Um, so certainly, I think uh, we do need to see what the department intends to do in response to this. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Linda, can I come in there, Chair? Yes, Paul. I'll come to you in a second. I see Linda's hand Thank is you. up. Just much the same as what what Rachel has said, and I've said this previously in the committee, and I'm, I'm just going to reiterate it. We have to look at the resourcing that we're putting into doing reports that have and reviews that have recommendations coming out of them if the recommendations are not going to be implemented. The reports have zero value other than telling us they know um, if the recommendations are not going to be implemented. And, and we really need to get to a point where recommendations either, you know, whenever they're they're implemented, we're told that's been implemented, or they were given very regular updates on here's where we're at in the implementation or here's why we can't implement and if and if, if we know that something cannot be implemented and we're given the reasons why and and we can't assist the department and find a way around that then we know and, and there's no point in doing a further review in two years or three years time into it to be given the same recommendation again to be told it can't be implemented so i think that 
you know, we, we really need to get to that point where if recommendations are not or cannot be implemented, here are the blockages. What way can the committee or the assembly assist us in removing those blockages? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Paul Free. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, this frustrates me every time because it happens every time. Uh, I think there's an issue here whereby people are just so busy and uh, whenever you get a report and then whenever you get uh, uh, media picking things up, then we are all concentrating on it and then it all disappears in the smoke again uh, and then we pick it up at, at the next report. Now, I'm not blaming anybody, it's just everybody's so busy, but I think there has to be some sort of structure in place that allows for the pressure to be applied consistently uh, so that we can deliver change, all of us, the committee helping and assisting the department. Uh, and we don't get that at the minute because it's very patchy. Uh, I think there's another issue too that needs to be raised and that is the one around uh, the one around the environment has changed since lockdown in the fact that people are not safe at home and they're being told to be stay at home and they're stuck at home. And that has added a lot of pressure onto the support groups and the charities and the voluntary groups that actually help these people. And there's no recognition that I can see um, in, in practical terms from the department as to how they're going to assist those people in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and it's not just about funding, it's about support uh, to help the support groups to help the victims. Uh, and that's something that worries me greatly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, listen, we will write in, in the terms that members have expressed themselves to the um, department um, and take it from there. Um, but the points are all very well made. Okay, well then, if members are content, we'll action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet, unless there's any comments members wish to make on any of the items that I didn't uh, highlight. Otherwise, we will take it forward based upon the um, cover sheet then. I have no business as chairman. Is there any other business for members? Linda? Just very quickly, um, Chairperson, I just would like to offer our solidarity and thoughts are with the, the female police officer whose home was attacked this week. And I certainly hope we won't see any more actions like this. We have a policing board for anybody that has issues with PS9 or how they're handling any issue at all, there is a democratic process of accountability and it's the police and board. And that's where, that's where PS9 as an organisation can be held accountable rather than attacking individual women and their children. Yeah, no, I concur with that and I think it's absurd to put out a, a, a claim on this that the three-year-old wasn't the target, but, you know, who was the target when you put it under the car, you know, it's indiscriminate in, in terms of who the victim would be. Um, so I, I agree with um, your comments, Linda, in respect of that. Okay, if there's no other business members, then um, we're due then next to meet um, Thursday the 29th of April, 2 o'clock, Senate Chamber or via the Starleaf facility. And thank you for your attendance today. Meetings adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.